patience, resilience, and surprising flexibility on the part of not only our students, faculty, and staff, but our sponsors as well. We are so grateful for the support of this year's SCOPE sponsors, enabling this group of seniors to have such a valuable learning experience. Our students are ready to share their work with you coming up in just a few minutes. Before we get rolling with the presentations, I'd like to introduce Olin's president, Gilda Barabino, to kick off today's program. Thank you so much, Ruth. I'm so honored and delighted to welcome everyone and thank everyone for being uh, with us today. Scope is one of the most exciting things that we have going on as we culminate at the end of the year. It exemplifies Olin. We are people-centered uh, engineering is, is at our core. And we are also having at our core student-centered project-based learning. And one of the ways we do that is to have real world externally partnered projects. And SCOPE embodies that. We also have one of our goals as we move forward in the future is to have equity within and through engineering. And the kinds of projects that our students are involved in with SCOPE actually helps us reach that goal as well. So I hope you are just as excited as I am about what's coming today in terms of presentations. This marks not only the culminations of some fantastic work that has been going on, it's also our way of signaling to the students of the start of goodbye with graduation, but goodbye just temporarily because at Olin we're a community that remains connected. I think you may know that we have partners from around the world joining us. There's been some challenging projects. Students have had guidance and mentorship from our industry partners. They're learning great professional skills along the way. And we have so many ways that this is helping us meet our ambitious goals, not just for what we do here, but how we're gonna change the world. So again, welcome. Thank you for being with us and enjoy the presentations to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Parabino. Again, we are grateful to our wonderful sponsors who are the backbone of this program. Most have sponsored many projects and we have several new partners this year as well. And even though they are listed on this slide, I really want to read their names in recognition of the importance of their role in Olin's academic program. Amazon Robotics, Arthur G. Russell Company, Boston Scientific, the Dassault Foundation supporting a scope team's collaboration with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Ford Motor Company, GE Healthcare, Mangata Networks, Microsoft, Pfizer, the Santos Family Foundation, supporting a scope team's collaboration with the Volpe National Transportation Center, and Twilio.org. Thank you so much. Please pretend you're hearing a big round of applause because that's really how it should be. Now I'd like to introduce Scott Hersey, who is the scope program director and associate professor of chemical and environmental engineering. All right, thanks Ruth and thanks President Barabino and, and thanks to all of you for joining us today for, for Scope Summit. I wanna briefly orient you to Scope as a program so you have a bit more context for the project presentations that you're about to see. At a high level, Scope is a student-centered learning experience that sits at the foundation of Olin's project-based curriculum. In scope, sponsors and faculty advisors support student teams in the execution of a significant real world project for and with an external sponsor. Scope is a, is a true capstone uh, in that it builds on an entire curriculum of learning experiences that look like the type of real world open ended and self directed engineering and design projects that we ask our students to engage with in scope. There are a number of important learning goals that are both developed and assessed in scope, but at a fundamental level, scope is designed to advance two primary goals. Through compelling and complex real world projects executed in collaboration with external partners, we first provide opportunities for the personal and professional development of our students. And second, we aim to create value for sponsors and, and also for the world through these projects. 
So through scope, we, we're fundamentally challenging the assumption that students must complete their degrees before they're able to create value in the world. But instead, scope is an opportunity for our students to develop as they are creating value. Scope projects come from a diverse set of sponsors representing a wide variety of engineering and design domains. But one thing that characterizes most good scope projects is that they represent the right class of problem. We conceptualize an organization's problems as falling into three broad classes. First is class one projects, and, and these are mission critical live or die problems that organizations invest substantial amounts of internal capacity and resources into solving. Class two problems are, are the type that represent significant potential for adding value to an organization, but there may not be enough of the right type of people resources or tools or approaches or mindsets or even facilities to invest in those problems internally. Third are class three problems that, that may be interesting, but ultimately any solution is likely to sit on a shelf and collect dust. We target class two problems in scope because they matter. And, and also because our student teams can truly uh, pull those problems out, make the project their own without impacting an organization's day-to-day -day operations. A significant number of our projects every year come from returning sponsors. And, and when we talk with those sponsors and, and ask, what is it that keeps you coming back to scope? There are a few things that we hear repeatedly. First is that our, our sponsors appreciate the fresh perspectives that students bring that result in unexpected solutions and solution spaces. These successful projects that our students execute spawn continued work and patents and other forms of intellectual property that have life within the organizations that sponsor scope. Second, through their established uh, presence on campus, scope sponsors regularly hire between 20 and 25 students per year to full time positions and, and internships. And finally, in, in partnering with scope. Sponsors are able to partner in the uh, overall Olin mission of being a catalyst for transforming engineering education more broadly. Scope projects take many different forms, including the design and prototyping of new things and new ideas that you traditionally think of as research and development, but also things like enhancing and adding features and capabilities to things that already exist. Uh, sometimes proposing and testing improvements to manufacturing and development processes. And finally, uh, engaging deeply with users to improve their experience with a product or a service. Today, you'll see a wide range of project presentations and that diversity represents not just the disciplinary domain that the technical work sits in, but also in the broader social, technical, ethical context that students have navigated throughout the year. All of these teams worked closely with their sponsors to understand the starting points and the goal endpoints together. And you'll see projects that represent the full range of the development cycle uh, with endpoints ranging from ideas and insights out to fully scaled prototypes that are ready for testing. Students have signed IP assignments as well as confidentiality agreements with their sponsors and everything that they share today has been approved by their sponsors. Uh, in the last week or two, students gave detailed final presentations privately to their sponsors and also delivered final reports. And today's event is, is a what you're going to get is a brief summary of what each project was about, what the teams created, how they created it, uh, and, and a little bit of that narrative of, of what they did, why it matters, and why it's special. Some of these teams are operating under fairly strict confidentiality agreements. So some of the pro uh, project presentations you may see, uh, they may focus a little bit more on their process than on the problem domain and the specific solution that they developed. One other piece of context that's important to, to note is that um, as the culmination of a hands-on project-based curriculum designed to emphasize in-person work on teams, it goes without saying that scope was not really designed for a year like this. 
This time last year, we were in the process of assembling our roster of sponsors and projects. And though we couldn't have exactly predicted what this year would look like, we did make sure to define projects that could be completed remotely with distributed teams in a lot of different places, just in case. And as it turns out, Scope was a remote, uh, fully remote experience for most of the student teams. Beyond the global pandemic, our, our students manage the cognitive and emotional load of an uncertain economy and job market, a chaotic election cycle, new seeds in America's ongoing national reckoning with our history and present reality of race-based inequity and injustice, and also the loss of two beloved members of the Olin community and faculty member Aaron Hoover and Austin Veseliza. Calling it a challenging year doesn't quite capture the reality on the ground for these teams, but I doubt that you'll detect it in the presentations you're about to see. And that's not because they're faking it for a public presentation that's high stakes, it's because they actually were this successful. And the biggest reason is our students. They're exceptionally driven, they're curious, adaptable, and committed people, and they're really resilient, and we're so proud of them. Also, Olin's curriculum set them up for success. In first year courses like modeling and simulation uh, and design nature, students are explicitly told that there may not be a right answer that you can put a box around. Courses like products and markets and user-oriented collaborative design ask students to start engaging with ideas and user groups with no end in mind except to learn, identify opportunities, prototype, test those prototypes, and adapt to changing circumstances in open-ended projects. So our curriculum is built around open-ended, self-directed problem solving, and that inherently requires adaptation. The challenges of this year have required constant adaptation, but our students were prepared. To our students, we're incredibly proud of how you navigated this year. And to the SCOPE leadership team, including Jessica and Ruth and the teaching team, thank you for your work to help orient students to which direction was up when they needed it. Also wanna thank again, our, our 11 amazing SCOPE sponsors without whom none of this would have been possible. Uh, thank you to each of you for your adaptability, your creativity, your commitment that you brought to the table this year as you supported our student teams and executing their projects. You're an essential part of not only bringing these projects into the SCOPE program, but also contributing to the personal and professional development of our students through their capstone experience. So thank you. I also wanna acknowledge the support provided by the SCOPE leadership team, consisting of uh, Director of Business Development, Ruth Levine, SCOPE Program Manager, Jessica McCarthy, and our team of SCOPE advisors and Alessandra Ferzoko, Alicia saring Siminski, Jason Woodard, and Lynn Stein. While all the credit for the projects you're about to see should go to the student teams themselves, these folks work tirelessly behind the scenes to shepherd the teams to success. I also wanna thank our subject matter experts who uh, are folks from within the Olin community who offered their own domain expertise to student teams throughout the year. Thank you for your commitment to scope and to these teams. Quick reminder of our, our schedule for the day. Um, we're gonna stop talking at you here in, in just a, a minute and we're gonna pass it over to student teams. Um, and you're gonna hear just a, a quick snapshot of what each project was about, and you'll get an invitation into breakout rooms that will follow this main event. Uh, so after a break, we're gonna come back together and uh, go into breakout rooms. So there'll be three opportunities to visit breakout rooms. So as you're seeing these snapshot presentations, encourage you to make note of which teams you wanna engage more deeply with, hear more about their project and have conversations with them about the work that they did. One last note about the format for this session. Um, you'll see slides uh, and you'll also see an active presenter. Uh, you'll be unable to unmute yourself until the very end when we'll do so to, to offer a round of applause for students. Um, we mentioned also that uh, Anusha from IT is here. Hi Anusha, uh, thanks for your support. If you have any technical difficulties, you can reach out to Anusha. Uh, her name is labeled as IT support uh, and she'll help you figure it out. 
You can also use the chat box to message everyone and send some love to teams and some encouragement along the way. Uh, but if you have project specific questions, we ask you to make note of those and bring them into the breakout rooms uh, at, the, at the end of this in our next phase of Scope Summit. Finally, for accessibility purposes, um, we are going to have um, closed captioning going for the rest of this. Apologize for, for not having that going up to this point. We're going to have closed captioning going for the rest of this session. We're also going to put a link to a PDF version of the slides in the chat uh, that you can use to navigate slides for this whole session. Um, and, and you'll also get slides for the breakout sessions when those start. Um, oh, sorry, brief notice, closed captioning has been running. Awesome, thanks. Uh, I don't see it in my view right here, so uh, I'm glad that's been going. Uh, if you have any other accessibility needs, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and, and we want to make this uh, navigable for, for everyone who's in attendance. All right, so without any further ado, we're going to pass it off to the scope 20 and 21 scope teams uh, and we're going to kick off with Amazon Robotics. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for coming to Scope Summit. Uh, we are the Amazon Robotics Scope team and this year we worked on advancing Amazon's micro fulfillment center. But first we'll talk a little bit about micro. First we'll talk a little bit about Amazon. All right, most of you probably know Amazon. Amazon is an e-commerce giant that's really grown in the last few years. They're known for their online website where you can order up to 350 million items. These items with just a few clicks of a button can arrive to your door within days. It's incredibly reliable and incredibly convenient. Well, what if Amazon could deliver these items to your door within hours, not within days? This is what micro fulfillment is all about. Currently, Amazon uses large centralized warehouses to store their goods. While it's really good for storing a lot of items, these big centralized stations can be hard to place. The concept of micro fulfillment means distributing these large fulfillment centers up into several different smaller micro fulfillment centers. And these can then be distributed closer to the end user. Let's find out a little bit more about Amazon's current fulfillment process to see how micro fulfillment can change it. Currently, when you place an order online, a signal is sent to the warehouse containing your item. An algorithm then tells a robot to go pick up a shelf containing your item. That robot goes and drives the shelf over to a worker who picks the item. And then once they have picked that item, send it on a series of conveyors over to someone else who sorts and packs that order. That order is then sent on another conveyor belt and eventually is translated to a carrier who delivers the item to your door. It's an efficient process, but because it has a lot of steps, it can take a few days for those items to get to your door. At a micro fulfillment center, these processes are faster. The first step is the same. When you place an order, an algorithm tells a robot to pick up your item. But in a smaller warehouse with fewer items and fewer robots, this can be completed more quickly. The next steps of the process are actually combined. Picking, sorting, and packing in a micro fulfillment warehouse is all completed at one single station. Again, this speeds up the process. And lastly, because these different fulfillment centers are more distributed and closer to you, delivery can happen more quickly. All of this is what makes micro fulfillment so promising and means that it can potentially bring items to your door within hours of your order. Over the last year, we learned a lot about micro fulfillment. We just spent time identifying, researching, and eventually developing some algorithms that Amazon Robotics could use in their micro fulfillment centers. And we also spent time ideating and designing and eventually have a single workstation that we are recommending to Amazon to use in their micro fulfillment centers. Through all of this, we helped answer questions such as, how do you combine several workstations into one and what makes a good workstation? In addition, things like why does a micro fulfillment center allow for better decision making and how do you intelligently command robots to retrieve items? It would be great to see you at our breakout room and we would love to tell you all that we have learned. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Quinn, um, and I'll be speaking on behalf of the Arthur G. Russell team and our project, the characterization and actuation of a vibratory testing platform. In the past 14 months, we've all seen the need for critical medical supplies to be produced and distributed as efficiently as possible. Say you're a supplier who sells plastic syringes. In order to deliver a consistent and timely product, the components of your syringes must be transported, assembled, and oriented correctly on your factory floor. Many manufacturers rely on vibratory parts feeding in situations like this, as vibratory excitation can be used to simultaneously move and reorient parts. In the syringe example, you might need a system that will take a whole pile of syringes, reorient them to face a uniform direction, and feed them into boxes that could be shipped off to hospitals. That's where Arthur G. Russell comes in. AGR is a company that specializes in developing automated manufacturing and assembly systems, and they have been a leader in vibratory parts feeding for over 70 years. AGR works with companies to develop custom manufacturing solutions for individual products in medical contexts, such as the syringe example, and in many other applications. For more context about what these systems might look like, here's a short clip that shows one of AGR's feeding systems. You can see small parts being fed through that um, conveyor section in the center. Um, they're dropped into vibratory feeding bowls um, and then eventually fed out through the back on one of those inline feeders. Now onto some specifics about how, these, about how vibratory feeding works. Changing frequency, the rate at which a system is being vibrated at, angle, the direction of the vibration, and amplitude, the amount of vibration, has a significant effect on the rate and behavior of parts that are fed in a vibratory system. It's really difficult to determine the optimal settings analytically, meaning that these parameters all need to be tuned for testing. This testing needs to be done for every single part that AGR develops a custom system for in order to determine the settings that will allow production to be most efficient. To study the effects of vibration parameters on parts feeding, last year's scope team designed an adjustable vibratory test platform in order to allow AGR to examine the effects of frequency, angle, and amplitude on a given part. When our team inherited this system, it lacked a sufficiently powerful actuator and also not much was understood about its performance. We spent this year exploring a number of ways to actuate the table, implemented several leading approaches, including pneumatic solutions, and worked to characterize the behavior and performance of the whole system. Once the platform has finished development, AGR will have a way to quickly determine the optimal settings that a part should be fed at in their customer's assembly line. Please come to our breakout room if you would like to learn more about the characterization and modeling of a vibratory system, mechanical integration of vibratory action, and some of our more profound shaking experiences. Thank you. Hi everyone, we're the, the Sears Boston Scientific Scope team and we're working on fluidics in next generation endoscopes. So endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography is an upright GI procedure used to diagnose and treat bile and pancreatic, pancreatic duct problems. This is a relatively low risk outpatient procedure gone through by about 500,000 people in the US annually. So in order to perform this procedure, a very specialized gastroenterologist must train for years to use this specified tool pictured on the right. It's called a duodenoscope. And as a result of this training, these physicians are highly reliant on muscle memory. As you can see in the picture, the device is fairly large, leading to inaccessibility and issues with repetitive strain as physicians need to rely solely on their fingers to both maneuver the scope and also perform the operation. So the endoscope also presents a set of sterilization challenges. First, the high barrier to adoption introduces a number of logistical challenges, both in surgery scheduling and scope reprocessing as a result of limited device availability. Secondly, the device itself is very intricate, making sterilization quite a challenge. This leads to a 15.25% contamination in reprocessed scopes as of 2020. And this all converges in room for device improvement. 
So in addition to these safety challenges, there's also a lot of room for ergonomic improvement. Duodenoscope design hasn't been re revisited since its invention. So um, it really has a lot of room to improve on. As mentioned earlier, the device is very large and inaccessible to many people with smaller hands and the repetitive button pushing increases physician hand strain throughout the procedure. So to combat the aforementioned challenges, Boston Scientific has introduced the Exalt Model D. It's a sterile single use scope modeled after currently available reusable duodenoscopes. However, the disposable nature of the scope eliminates the need for reprocessing and also introduces the potential for a future ergonomic improvement in the handle design. However, as the fluidic system was not designed for disposability, it's not quite performing as expected. So that brings us into our constrained problem space for this year. Our goal was to introduce a new fluidic system that is able to maintain function while enabling ergonomic improvements. However, because physicians have a lot of muscle memory surrounding the procedure, they want familiar device performance. So to learn more about how we worked within this constrained problem space, please join us in our breakout room. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Amy Fung and today I'd like to present to you all our ROV VR project. Thanks to funding from the Dassault Systems Foundation, we've been working on this project in collaboration with MBARI, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute that's based out of Moss Landing, California. Our project centers around the ROV or remotely operated underwater vehicle, which is used to understand the ocean and our impact on it. Pictured here is Ambari's ROV dock rickets, which they use for scientific study in the deep ocean at depths of up to 4,000 meters. Here's what the current control room for this ROV looks like. Seated at the center of the displays is the pilot who controls the ROV, and to their right is a scientist who identifies targets of scientific interest. Successfully collecting a sample requires seamless communication between the pilot and scientist, but the existing control room makes this challenging. In conversations with one of the scientists, they noted that they've been using laser pointers to communicate with the pilot targets of scientific interest, which is pretty old school. While this works to some degree, it relies on the technology available when it was built along with the ship 25 years ago. From our conversations with scientists and pilots at Embari, some of the pain points of the existing control room include the limited tools available for communication, the fact that the TV monitors are quite bulky and can't be reconfigured easily, and that the current control room requires a lot of skill and training to operate due to the significant cognitive load it poses. Our objective in this project was to explore the potential for integrating modern day virtual reality tools into ROV piloting, which we hope will improve collaboration between scientists and pilots. Towards this goal, we created a prototype virtual reality app with features that otherwise wouldn't have been possible to implement in the existing control room. Some of the features we'd like to highlight here include live stereo footage, which will give the pilot depth perception, hand-based UI control, which will enable quick rearranging of the displays, multi-user support, which will facilitate communication between the pilots and the scientists, and 3D data overlays, which present the data in a more intuitive form than in the existing control room. To the extent of our knowledge, this will be the first VR application that will be tested at depths of up to 4,000 meters. This semester, we were able to test run our app with several different pilots operating Ambari's mini ROV in their saltwater test taking facility. Overall, the pilots are super enthusiastic about our app and are excited to test it out at sea to compare it to the existing control room. Although this, although this may be the conclusion of our work, this project will continue to live on. Ambari plans to take our app to sea for further testing during the summer, and our research group at UC Santa Cruz is looking to do in-depth user studies with our app to quantify whether or not our app actually reduces task completion time. Other avenues of improvement include integrating advanced features like Ambari's ongoing work with machine learning-based organism tracking and continuing to make other general UI revisions. There's also discussion at Embari about potentially using the results from this testing to create a control room designed around VR 
for their new ship that will eventually replace the one that used for the ROV dock rickets. Thanks for listening to our presentation. If you'd like to hear more about the implementation details of our VR control room or about our user testing experiences, please come to visit us during our breakout room session. We hope to see you there. Hi, everyone. Um, I will be presenting today for the Olin Ford scope team. Uh, our project is titled Life Interrupted Mobility After a Pandemic. Before we begin, we just want to make a big shout out and thank you to Elaine and Brad from Ford and then our advising professor, Professor Alicia. All of you helped so much and we wouldn't be here today without you. And thank you as well to everyone at Ford and Olin that's not named on this poster who helped us get where we are. So for some project background, our initial prompt given to us by Ford was, consider how might the experience of a global pandemic impact mobility needs, attitudes, and behaviors around Flink. As you can tell, this was a very open-ended prompt, and it allowed us a lot of room to explore the various ways this project could go. Um, this open-ended question led us to developing a human-centered cyclical design process. Each time we went in this cyclical process, we would start with research and planning, this research comprised of secondary user research, such as watching YouTube videos of people who started van life during the pandemic, or finding articles about how the pandemic has shifted transportation and mobility. This would then lead us to exploration and user engagement. So under exploration, we would be doing user engagement, such as sending out surveys or interviewing our users or holding co-designs. In addition to doing this user engagement, we also wanted to do some experimentation. In a typical year, this experimentation would involve connecting with users and having them actually perform the experiments themselves. But unfortunately, that was not able to be done due to COVID. So instead, we actually did the experiments ourselves with people we lived with in order to learn from those experiences moving forward. All of this secondary and primary user research led us to synthesizing. So we'd come up with insights each round or questions that would drive the next cycle. And we went through this process multiple times throughout the year. This whole process led us, led us to this idea that COVID is a catalyst. It's been accelerating some trends in transportation and reacting with others to create new trends. And all of this culminates in creating long lasting shifts in the transportation needs, priorities, and patterns. This COVID as a catalyst idea led us to, these, to four main insights that help us understand the significance of COVID-19 for users and new considerations for future Ford projects. We then looked at these four main insights and identified two idea opportunity areas. And within those two idea opportunity areas, we have actionable future ideas for Ford to embrace moving into a post-COVID future. If you'd like to learn more about these four main insights and two idea opportunity areas, please come to our breakout room. Thank you. Good afternoon. We are the GE Healthcare Scope team, and today Vienna and I will be presenting to you about the patient to operator intercom for CT scanners, which we worked on this year. A CT scanner is a medical imaging device which allows healthcare providers to quickly and accurately determine best forms of treatment for a patient. We have one pictured on the slide here, where the large cube with a hole through the middle is known as the gantry. During a CT scan, a patient lying down can be moved inside and out of the gantry depending on what is being imaged. An operator assists the patient through this process, but during a scan is located in another room and depends on an intercom to communicate with the patient. This is the intercom which we worked on developing this year. During a scan, all communication between the operator and the patient is passed through the intercom. For the patient who might have a concern or some question, um, this intercom provides a way to engage with the operator. Additionally, operators consistently use the intercom to give the patient instructions, such as to hold your breath. Making sure these instructions are conveyed clearly ensures consistent, consistent and quality scans, saving both time and money. Important to the design of this intercom system was to account for the noise that the CT scanner makes during operation. In an ideal system, only the patient's voice would be relayed to the operator and the noise of the scanner removed. This is what we set out to do in our intercom using digital noise cancellation techniques. In pursuing this goal, our work spanned three major design spaces. Algorithm development includes the actual set of instructions which were used to filter the CT noise from the system. The algorithm needs to be hosted on some electrical hardware for which we used a plug and play development module. 
Finally, we considered in depth the effect that mechanical enclosures would have on the system uh, performance as well. This is an overview of the system architecture. On the left-hand side, this is the patient room where the CT gantry is located. And on that gantry, there are two microphones that are placed about a meter apart. These microphones need to pick up two different signals. The first is only picking up the CT gantry noise, while the second picks up the gantry noise in addition to the patient's voice so that the noise cancellation algorithm can subtract the noise from both signals, leaving just the voice. Additionally, the adaptive noise canceling algorithm is filtering the audio as it passes from the patient room to the operator side. We also implemented dual direction communication so the operator can talk back to the patient. And on the right hand side, we have this scan control intercom module so that the operator can control the system. This is a picture of the integrated prototype that we created on campus here at Olin. And the central structure there is a cardboard mock gantry. Most of the components here are similar to on the slide that I just showed you uh, with the addition of these two speakers that are outputting audio signals to emulate the testing environment. One of them is playing the patient's voice while the other is playing gantry noise that was recorded from GE Healthcare CT machine. On this slide, we have uh, graphs of our results. The first is a plot of the voice and the noise. And then in the second plot, we have the output of our system after the noise cancellation algorithm has been applied. And in the third plot, this is the original voice recording for reference. If you'd like to learn more about our project and listen to some audio recordings from our test results, we'd love to speak with you in our breakout room later on. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. Um, Welcome to the Mangata Scope Team snapshot presentation, where we will showcase our project on a low cost antenna control unit. My name is Jillian, and with Sebastian, Kyle, Maddie, and Brandon, we'd like to extend special thanks to those at Olin, Mangata, and beyond for their help, encouragement, and expertise during this project. So over the course of the year, our own team members have struggled with the difficulty that is satellite internet. Currently, half the world does not have reliable access to the internet, which is rapidly becoming a worse problem in today's world, particularly when we are dependent on it for communication, education, virtual social connection, and capstone projects like ours. Mangata Networks aims to provide low cost, reliable satellite internet for underserved regions. So why aren't current satellite technologies providing this already? But this problem is in part caused by the current standard of using a network of what are called geostationary satellites, which can cover large areas but do not reach high latitudes on Earth. Mangata will instead use satellites in mid and high elliptical orbit as they regularly pass over these undeserved areas and provide a direct line of communication. Additionally, these satellites will be closer in orbit than their geostationary counterparts which will speed up communication between space and ground. However, satellites in these new orbits do not appear stationary from our perspective on the ground. This means that instead of an immobile antenna like those used for TV, our dish must move and react to track the satellite. The problem that our scope team was tasked to solve was to build a prototype antenna control unit or ACU that could solve this problem. So to implement Mangata's vision, we built a series of smaller sub-projects within an alpha prototype in the fall and beta prototype in the spring. We started by designing and assembling an alpha prototype of the mechanical system, which allowed us to test our tracking code and electronic setup. We designed a custom PCB to operate our system based on findings from the alpha prototype. The code was fine-tuned to give us more accurate results. And finally, a mass manufacturable beta prototype was designed. All of these things will be discussed further in our breakout presentation. So Mangata is not the only company trying to popularize satellite internet. For example, SpaceX's Starlink program, a similar technology, is already running in some parts of the country. However, each antenna has a production cost of about $1,500. That price gets higher when you look at other companies such as the marine antenna market, which can get well over 30,000. One of the goals was to see how cost-effective we could make the, this ACU, 
and our beta prototype unit cost is intended to make the technology more accessible to users. Our ACU at $750 production cost is quite low cost compared to others in the industry. And again, this cost could go down further with more refinement of our current prototype. Now that we've handed the project off to Mangata, future developments for the company will include a further reduction in cost with increased manufacturability and design improvements, an upgrade to the antenna designed for service, and further software developments to allow for a plug and play like operation. Come see our breakout room to learn more. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Ashley and we are the Microsoft Scope team and our project is called Seeing UI, Researching Web Accessibility Improvements for Screen Reader Users. So this is Harper. She is a highly confident screen reader user that we talk to. I asked you to start your video, I'm so sorry. Okay, um, she's a highly competent screen reader user that we talked to in her late 40s, and she's accustomed to navigating the web without sight because, oh, I'm so sorry, the world without sight because she has been blind since birth. When Harper has time, she loves sailing and riding her bike. I see that is what that notification was. <laughs> So like most people, Harper needs to be able to navigate the internet and access to the web is crucial for education, access to resources, employment, and for some socialization. Harper uses a tool called a screen reader in order to navigate the web. And it's a tool that speaks the content of a web page rather than displaying it visually. So let's take a look at how that sounds. Manager of Client Services Outreach, Fed, FedEx, Warehouse Package Handler, Link. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press Control. Chrome has new window. Head, heading Level 3. Heading Level 3. Job and Company in Links. You are Apply now. Harper was moving around the screen with her keyboard, and the rectangle that you saw shifting about is called the focus, which allows her to interact with specific components. So in theory, a screen reader user can access any website that a sighted person could, but in practice, that's not always the case. Manager of Client Services Outreach, Fed, FedEx, Warehouse Package Handler, link. You are currently on a link. To click this link, all right. So Harper's been looking for a job for a while now, and she's been visiting a lot of different websites that have inaccessible pop-ups when she's trying to apply. So here we see a pop-up on Glassdoor, and in order to proceed, Harper needs to sign in or create an account, but her screen reader's focus hasn't shifted to the pop-up. It's still behind the pop up on the page, and that means she can't fill out these fields, which means she can't sign in, uh, which means she can't apply for jobs and this completely blocks her from using Glassdoor or it forces her to ask someone who's cited for help. Pop ups are not the only problem that Harper faces by far on the web. She shared with us. I'm excited by all the content I can access until someone mentions elements on a site that my screen reader is completely unaware of. Then I feel as though I've run into a brick wall while rushing ahead at high speed. Accessibility problems can be incredibly demoralizing for screen reader users, and they can have severe consequences in people's lives. Harper is a real person that we talk to, and she's been unable to find employment for months due to inaccessible job listing websites. And to make matters worse, her state's website is also inaccessible that she needs to use to fill out unemployment vouchers, which require, requires her to ask for cited assistance every week in order to get the financial support that she needs. There are hundreds of accessibility problems like the one that we've just seen. So in the broad scheme of things, it's incredibly challenging to know which ones to prioritize. And that is why Microsoft tasked our scope team with finding a handful of accessibility problems that could be solved to make the most meaningful impact on the blind community. To identify those problems, we spent nine months talking to accessibility experts and interviewing people who are blind, as well as conducting a survey. Ultimately, we identified three impactful technical solutions 
that address significant challenges for blind screen reader users, one of which focuses on pop-ups. And we developed these three ideas into functional specifications. So as our project is coming to a close, we're handing these proposals off to a team at the University of Texas at Austin, who will be facilitating their implementation, which we are so excited to see. So to find out the other accessibility issues that we identified as high impact, come to our breakout room. We would love to see you there. And to close out, we'd like to give a special thank you to Microsoft for funding this project. They are leaders in the accessibility space, doing great work, making wonderful tools, and will be using this research to inform the tools that they create, as well as the continued support from the University of Texas, Austin, throughout the project. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you in our breakout room. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our quick overview of the wireless and student network that we created for Pfizer this year for a scope project. A very important part of how Pfizer develops new medication is their supply chain, especially in their preclinical drug trials. This includes everything from the warehouses where the drugs are stored, to the shipping department, to the doctors who prescribe the medication, and finally, the most important part to Pfizer, the patients who take the medication. The importance of the supply chain was especially seen recently during the COVID-19 pandemic as Pfizer developed their new COVID-19 vaccine. In order to make sure that drugs are safe for human consumption, Pfizer keeps the temperature and humidity in their warehouses to the highest standards. However, monitoring this requires a lot of time and manpower. Our team of engineers worked to improve Pfizer's drug management monitoring system by developing a wireless system of devices and interfaces to monitor environmental conditions in the supply chain. So in our solution, we created wireless sensing devices that sit inside of the drums where the uh, drugs are stored. These devices detect temperature, humidity, the remaining stock within the drums, and also any time the lids are open. The, this data is then collected and then visualized for Pfizer employees in order to highlight important metrics. So as a quick overview of our system, our system includes the sensor boards with our, which are within the drums, the mesh networks which connect all of the sensor boards together, and this sends the data to the network controllers, which compiles all of the data from all the different sensor boards, and then sends it to the data, data analytics software, which visualizes the data for Pfizer employees. In order to hear a more in-depth discuss discussion about what our system does and how, it, how it's implemented, please come to our breakout rooms. And finally, we would just like to acknowledge all the people at Pfizer who helped us, as well as our scope advisor, who really helped us understand the importance of this project and how it should be implemented. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk to you next about Ruina, a mobile application that our team developed to improve the collection of motor vehicle crash data. Our team this year was really lucky to work with two sponsor organizations. First, our sponsors, the Santos Family Foundation, and our liaisons through the U.S. Department of Transportation Volpe Center. This project began with those organizations a year ago, with that team being given the wide open problem space of the fact that crash data, when it's good and we have a large quantity, leads to analysis that really saves lives. But how could it be better? That team looked at the overall crash reporting ecosystem from the capture of data at the scene of a motor vehicle crash through the pipeline up to the point where analysts are researching that data and making decisions about what to change to improve safety. That team zoomed in on the current process of officers, finding a lot of room for improvement in that area. So what is that current process? Well, as an officer, you get a call, there's been a crash. You arrive at the scene and your number one priority is to secure the area and make sure everyone is safe. It's only once they've got things under controlled and handled to a degree that they can start collecting data. They pull out their piece of paper and clipboard and they start making observations and talking to individuals involved. The kind of data they're collecting is about contact information for the individuals driving and riding in the vehicles, information about the vehicles themselves and any factors and conditions that could have led to this crash. 
Eventually, they arrive back at their station, and while many officers are still using paper forms, their jurisdictions rely on digital report management systems, so they have to take the extra time to translate all of their written work into that digital system. At this point, the officer's part of the crash report process is over, but as told earlier in the ecosystem, that report will live on, whether it's kept in the jurisdiction for individuals involved to reference later, or it goes on to live at a state or national level database. That's where Ruina comes in. This is an application that was identified and put to a proof of concept stage by the team last year, and that our team worked to develop further and get to a point where it's ready to be put in the hands of officers. Ruina is designed to make that current process easier and faster while also integrating with their current digital systems. Some of the things we focused on this year were key features like the scanning of driver's license barcodes to auto populate a lot of driver information. Uh, the creation of a PDF output form that looks very similar to existing state crash report forms and putting the first version of our application on the Google Play Store to get it out for some initial testing. If you join our breakout room later today, you can hear more about those things see a demo video of Ruina in action, and join us for our open Q&A discussion, which I like to think of as a sort of choose your own adventure of the many topics that we can discuss. Thank you. Hello. We are the scope team that worked with Twilio to build a customizable communication tool designed for use in disaster response. Communication is often referred to as the lifeline of any business. It is what ultimately drives progress and relationships. Our sponsor, Twilio, utilizes their cloud communications tools and platform to provide that lifeline for so many organizations. You have likely interacted with Twilio without realizing it. They provide messaging channels for services such as Lyft and Match.com, and notification systems for Coca-Cola vending machines. Twilio believes empowering communication will change the world and are actively pursuing so through Twilio.org. Twilio.org is the social impact arm of Twilio and is focused on supporting nonprofits engagement and communication. Twilio.org has a goal to impact 1 billion people through their technology and platform. To put this in perspective, there are an estimated 3 million nonprofit organizations globally, with Twilio.org currently working with six to 7,000 of them. A recent survey indicated that less than 1% of developers work for nonprofits. For Twilio to extend its outreach in this space, they must lower any technological barriers to accessing their products. To do so, Twilio has put emphasis on templates tools to show the art of the possible. Templates are created to demonstrate use cases and interaction between Twilio communication tools. They must display functionality out of the box while also having clear opportunities for customization. The goal of our scope project was to build a function-driven template that leverages Twilio's suite of products to aid communication in the disaster relief space. These are the organizations we worked with throughout this project. Most organizations in this space depend on volunteers as a workforce. We identified communication between the volunteers and their coordinators as a universal challenge across many of the organizations we worked with the coordinators are both an integral part of the volunteering process, as well as one of its largest roadblocks. So many people depend on the coordinators that they are often over encumbered. Nobody is born a volunteer. Uh, they become one by gaining an interest in the work organizations are doing and wanting to know more. They ask questions, which is excellent but at great volumes, questions can overwhelm volunteer coordinators. This is not ideal, especially because a coordinator's job is so much more than just responding to volunteer inquiries. 
This user journey shows the interaction between coordinators and volunteers. Our project revolved around making these two journeys as independent as possible. Our solution is an easily deployable chatbot template trained on common questions that volunteers ask coordinators. This template responds to volunteers but can redirect back to the coordinator if the volunteer asks something the bot cannot answer. The bot empowers volunteers to act more independently from their coordinators and alleviates a repetitive part of the coordinator's workload. The template we made was built entirely on the Twilio infrastructure. And if you'd like to know more about the technical aspects of our solution, the processes that led us to this conclusion, and how we're getting this solution out into the world, come visit us in our breakout room. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Excellent work. So we're that was the that was the end of our team's presentations for the snapshots. We're going to just ask people, uh, you now have the ability to unmute. We'd love to just give a round of applause to students. That was Yay! really awesome. Oh, <laughs> Good job. Good job. It's, it's really fun in a moment like that when you hear a woohoo and you know exactly who it came from. Just the, those are <laughs> those are fun moments in a crowd of 226 on, on Zoom. So uh, really proud of you all. As I said this before, uh, teams, you did an amazing job this year. We're so proud of the work that you did and, and more important, the way that you navigated the year uh, of doing these projects. So well done. Um, Quick reminder of, of our schedule for, for what's coming next. That was the end of our snapshot presentations by, by teams. We're gonna move into a break and we're uh, exactly on time. So I'm feeling pretty, pretty happy about that. Um, we're gonna take a break for the next 15 minutes. When you come back at 2.15, there will be breakout rooms open. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there will be an option to choose breakout rooms. It's, it's not there yet, but... Um, when you come back, you can open that up and there will be a breakout room for each team. So hopefully you, you found uh, at least three uh, projects that you want to hear a little bit more about. You go to that breakout room and that team will get started at uh, 2.20 for the first breakout session. That session will look like a six to eight minute deeper dive into the project work that they did, followed by 10 to 12 minutes of conversation about their projects. So we encourage you to, to have video on, uh, unmute and engage with the team around the project. So ask them a lot of questions uh, and just show them your curiosity in the work that they did. So we will end each breakout session at the 18 minute mark. Somebody from each team will, will signal that it's time to transition to the next breakout room. And the next one will start on the 20 minute mark. Uh, so there will be breakout sessions that start at 2.20, 2.40, and then at three o'clock. And then at the very end at three, uh, 3.20, we're gonna come back into this main session. We'll close all the breakout rooms just for a few closing words. And then some of us from the scope side will stick around for some Q&A about the program. And the breakout sessions encourage you to introduce yourself, uh, ask questions along the way via the chat box, but also ask them in real time um, at the end of the presentation. It, it, in a also effort to, to make these presentations more accessible, teams will share a link to the slides that they're gonna present at the beginning of each breakout session. You can also access closed captioning at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, there's an option for, it says CC in a box for live, tra live transcript, uh, if that's something that helps you engage uh, more effectively. Um, I think that is it. You you will have the ability to navigate and, and to shift between breakout rooms on your own. If you have any trouble whatsoever, if, you, if you're lost and want to get into the next breakout room, just come back into the main session and we'll get you where you need to go. All right, that's it for now. We're going to move into break and we'll see you all in 15 minutes at 2.15.